As filmmakers, we understand the power of cinema. We know that years from now, we will be old, only to be regarded as a lifelong factor of time. I am talking to you today to teach you of a past that many may forget. This is a story that connects you to the land, the water, and the struggles of our people's survival. I cannot predict the future. I can only speak the way I feel, communicate to you as if you were my child, because you are the future. I don't want you to be lost. I want to remind you that the earth you stand upon is your mother, and the sky your father. Once you see the world as living, then maybe you won't create the same mistakes we have. Down went my cane. Down went my cane. The gun, no yash shorter. Down went my cane. Down went my cane. The rivers uh, don't stand still. They continue. They have a purpose. They continue to move. The prayers are really about maintaining harmony. Uh, on, on the land for our benefit and the benefit of the future peoples that's going to follow us. Uh, the holy people say we're going we're gonna to make people, we're going to have people on the surface of the earth. And with all these bad things that harms their, their body, we're going to bury them in the ground so the people won't be exposed to that danger. So uranium, one of those things that were buried. Oil was one of those things that were buried. Coal are one of those things that were buried underneath the, the ground. There's all kind of gas that were put in the ground so that they don't harm the people. But the day you bring it up to the surface, then there's going to be illness, there's going to be sickness, and, and the, the people's going to be dying from it. That, that was the law that was established. That's why they were supposed to stay put in, in the ground. And our teaching is to leave, leave things where they are and just use what's available to you on the surface of the earth, not, not dig into the earth. Or leave the water flowing, the river flowing, and don't dam up the river because you it's like the flow of life, you put in a blood on and you stop the flow of life. That's what you're doing to the natural things that, uh, that makes Earth what it is. The underdeveloped and colonial peoples of the Earth 
have seen the comforts of modern science, industry, and agriculture, and they're reaching out for what they've seen. But the price of what we think of as progress could be the end of a cherished way of life. This price may be more than some can pay. We have come to a point in our lives now to understand the roots of our culture and to contribute our talents to tell our people's story. We started as kids, trying to make a dent in the world, using our boredom, free time, and lack of enthusiasm for high school to inspire our creativity. Yet as we got older, we transitioned out of this once imagined world. We began to see our culture, our grandparents, and our reservation, and our people as ourselves. I was born on the Navajo Reservation, but most importantly, I was raised in the Hopi culture. I adapted to both perspectives, Navajo and Hopi. As a child, I never understood the significance of why the Kachinas or the Yebiches sang. As I grew older, their songs were simple prayers, meant for the earth, the water, and the people. We inspired each other to seek out stories, however sad, funny, and true. We were given the honor to sit with our elders and to discuss our struggles, to understand our people's existence and what we can do to save our culture. We simply started how we always started, picking up the camera and filming. When we talked to some of these elders, they mentioned that the culture is tied into the landscape. And I realized that some of these large industrial complexes were built over our sacred sites. Through this documentary, I have learned that these industries around our reservation have played into our family's lives, as well as our culture. I don't want these stories to be lost. I don't want our people, our grandparents, or our culture to be forgotten. My goal has simply been to learn from what I have filmed and to share our knowledge with future generations of Navajo people. However, the more footage Jake and I collected regarding issues within our Navajo landscape, the more horrendous and serious the content became. Uh, the first people were given two choices. You either take this yellow substance or you take this yellow substance. And uranium. They're both almost, you look, when you look at it, it's almost the same. So the people chose the corn pollen. And never to be disturbed, never to be brought up. If you bring it to the top, going to cause... Uh, devastation to the Navajo, uh, to the people. That's what we're going through. We're approaching the Perko Wash. This is uh, the uh, wash where the uh, July 16, 1979, 
you can see meal spill happen. So this is part of the wash where this part, part core wash runs all the way through, right through the center of Gallup, all the way through Holbrook, all the way to Winslow. In 1979, at Church Rock, New Mexico, northeast of Gallup, a dam at the United Nuclear Corporation mill broke, setting 95 million gallons of radioactive water and 1,100 tons of radioactive mill waste down the Puerco River, eventually leading into the Little Colorado River shed. So now we're going to be coming up to a small community that is sandwiched between two abandoned mine sites for more than 30 years. You didn't say they didn't do anything, especially on their mine property up in the, up in the canyon up that way. A lot of that uh, contamination blew over the, uh, the community here. This is the Redwater Pond community. Later in life, I found out that it was unsafe because I worked there. You know, being a single parent, I had to find a job, and that's where I worked, down in the mines alongside the miners. And back in 2006, I was um, diagnosed with lymphoma. And we think it's probably from that. So I've been having health problems just from the chemo, from the cancer. It wasn't mandatory that we wear respirators, so there's times when my job required to be almost right behind the miners. And so a lot of times I had to go back into these tunnels where there was no ventilation. And so I did that for over seven and a half years. Sometimes uh, places would be filled up with water, kind of had to crawl on the side, or sometimes I'd just go right into the water. They'd be up to past my knees. I'm experiencing a respiratory problem, and I contribute that to breathing in the dust. If this were to happen in Los Angeles, Phoenix, or New York City, this would be taken care of in a heartbeat. Yet it happens here, on our reservation. This uranium is evil. Once dug up and oxidized, it has the potential to genetically affect future generations of people, including me. As uranium decays, one of the degradation products is radon, which has a very short half-life, and it tends to bind to particles, and that's why they caution people in homes where you smoke, where there's a lot of particles in the air. Radon can cling to those particles and get taken into the deep lungs. Very similar situation in the mines where you had a lot of dust and you had a lot of diesel exhaust from the equipment that was underground and the radon particles could also cling to that. So it got inhaled by the miners, deposited in the lungs, and there it's quite toxic. It causes lots of damage. It can either break cells and pass on with um, damage to the DNA. Um, it can kill cells outright. Um, and it can also not cause any damage to the cells. So, um, you know, radiation has a mixture of possible effects, and obviously what we associate is the damage that either kills cells directly and leads to long-term damage in organs or that leads to genetic damage that then gets passed on through generations. Just 100 yards from the Little Colorado River, outside the community of Cameron, Arizona, with no signs of telling us to stay out or warning us of high radiation, there lied a contaminated open pit uranium mine. In a recent New York Times article published April 1st, 2012, radioactivity 
at the former mine is said to measure 1 million counts per minute, translating to a human dose that scientists say that could lead directly to malignant tumors. The article also mentions two days of exposure at the Cameron site would expose a person to more external radiation that a nuclear regulatory commission would consider safe for an entire year. I had uh, tumors, big old tumors growing on me, which I wasn't aware of. And then till now, that was um, just like my neck. Right down here, there's a long scar. And uh, the tumor was removed. And that they cut and boost my nerves. And that's why I can't, I'm not, I'm not like I used to be anymore. It's, uh, it's, um, uh. We've compared the water quality from the wells that people have reported that they have been drinking from. So we're talking about unregulated water sources, the ones that were originally put in for um, use in watering livestock or some of the springs that are naturally occurring springs that people still use for drinking water. And what we found is that the most common exceedances of those are highest for arsenic and second for uranium. Some of that is related to the legacy of uranium mining. Some of it is naturally occurring uranium. And uranium was mined here because uranium is here. There's problems with my children. There's, I have two sons and a daughter, and my generation's gone. My generation's gone. They don't want to have, my daughter doesn't want to have babies because they won't, they can come out the farm. There's a lot of depression. As you can see, all the rocks fell down and probably hiding a lot of things. They've been working, they've been working, trying to hide everything, but you could see it, you know, with me. I wonder what our ancestors who roamed this area so many years ago may be thinking as they look down from heaven on this ceremony today. I am sure that they may be a little puzzled and perhaps bewildered at the events that are taking place today on the sleepy plains where once they chased game and fought the blue coats of the federal government. We're at a, at a time for change and restructuring and what we don't see is individuals Navajo Nation registered voters, members coming to us and saying this is the way we want our government to be. Nobody is bringing in a document or a plan to us. So I really believe that they need to be part of this. This is their chance through the chapters or through organization, through schools, what have you. They need to be part of the government. How would you like to see your government in the future? Do we need a reservation? Shall we keep a reservation status? Or shall we become part of the state, part of the United States, really truly become part of that? Those type of issues is what we, we, we're I'm going to be wrestling with here the next couple of years. Where are we headed? When we say a sovereign nation, what are we really talking about? We're just copying other sovereigns. So to me, I don't think we're really truly a sovereign nation. The government, through their treaty with us, have given us a right to, within this reservation, which is trust land, to 
form our own government and to basically oversee each other. That's basically all it is. And so sometimes I wonder, are we, is our alliance here in Navajo or are we, are, is our alliance the United States government? We do all the rest from here, but in order to make it valid, the government still has to sign off on it, which is the Interior Department with the, the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So we still rely on them because we're still under their jurisdiction. In a continuing program, the Tribal Council promotes development of tribal-owned businesses and encourages industries to locate on the reservation where unemployment remains a serious problem. Right now, Navajo Nation has an unemployment rate of 54%. And from the age 18 to 45, we see that generation not living on the Navajo Nation because there's no job opportunities. You know, they, they, the only opportunities to move to you know, other places to find jobs and work. Right now at our home site here, we don't have running water. We haul like twice a week, about like 10 barrels, uh, so 20 barrels every week we have to haul like to, for our livestock here. And that's like, usually we go to Hard Rock, which is like 15 miles, so that's 30 miles round trip. For three 55 gallon barrels, we pay about $1.71 at Hard Rock, but there are other places that are more expensive than that. And here, the Navajo Aquifer has been used for a long time, and people down here, they don't have access and use of that water. What has happened is that we have created an oasis for Phoenix, and they have taken our o oasis away from us. During the summer, I usually have two two drums here, two, one on that side and one here. I don't remember. I was close to 500 gallon all all together. So this one right now, this guy's on break. And uh, but summer, I I probably uh, make my trips about three times a day for the sheep, for the horses, and for the for the cattle. When this, when this fills up, I transfer it to here. That's why you see just like, like here. So this is just uh, one of the ways uh, to be easy on ourselves to, to, to collect water by runoff from the, uh, from the roof for our animals and for our plants, trees, and uh, especially uh, orchards, peaches, and apples. And it's really rough. For us, it's not only me, it's the rest of the people that are trying to live this way of life. Before the power plants, I guess the old people always used to know when this, the monsoons are coming. That's how people survive and they depend on that and how this, how they plant it. But now it's just, it seems like everything just went, went unorganized, looks, looks like. Some more, the monsoons, sometimes they don't come around. The cost, um, as far as associated to cold, it's damaged our water. It's damaged, if we put a price tag on that, how much would that come up to? Mm -hmm. It's damaged um, our children's health and people's health with respiratory illnesses and asthma. Let's put a price tag on that. It's damaged the land quality and ability to do, if we wanted to do farming um, or build a home. It's, it's, it's relocating our people from off our land it's, it's doing all these things, so it's making us um, unsustainable, I think. Very few people farm, actually farm, and they're actually getting um, money from it. A lot of the farming that I see now is just basically like a, a family unit. That's their farm for, 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 for just their family, that's it. None of it is really being sold or exported. So we're, 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 we're not in the, really in the farming business right now. And that's why one of some of our water rights settlement has been very, very hard because we couldn't prove that we're gonna use this for irrigation. 
but because of our resources, our uh, natural resources that we have. That's what we're so dependent on right now. Our, our own raw material that's being mined on our homeland. Why can't we just come produce power from, from the sun and then come directly to the people that don't need any any desecration of anything, the land, the water, or the air. There's these signs that are being, that are there, that, you know, the pressure in the wells have gone down, um, and that, you know, that's where we need Department of Interior, the Secretary, to stop the use, or have Peabody not use the water anymore. The rate of the water, the price of the water, it was at the time when they were slurring coal to uh, Lofton, Nevada, was at $900 to $1,000 per acre foot. It's, it's rated at $471 per acre foot now. What? So that's the, another finding that uh, was also um, of our concern too, of this pristine Ice Age water as that value of the water. And what was the original agreement? Oh, five dollars per acre foot. And to Hopi, it was uh, one dollar and sixty-seven cent per acre foot. Uh, the past several years is to establish the Navajo Green Economy Commission and the Navajo Green Economy Fund. And twice now, Ben Shelley, our president, has line item vetoed um, this initiative to get funded. Twice. This fund, our, our vision for this fund is to support local green businesses on Navajo Nation, which includes supporting traditional practices of our people, such as continued sheep raising, sheep herding, using the wool, farming, sustainable ranching, green building, energy efficiency projects, great green projects. The, the thing that I don't think we really, Navajo leadership has done is make farming a priority. It's not a priority. If President Shelley and the council agrees to make farming a priority, number one priority, number two, then we're definitely gonna to have to fund it. We haven't done that yet. And nobody has talked about that yet. It's talked about during the campaign, but other than that, once we get in office, nobody talks about that. Shelly Jim, 396. Lovejoy Tooley, 168. <laughs> Chishin Shlot Shipashish Chin, 
To this day, the multi-billion dollar company continues to deplete the Navajo people's only source of potable drinking water, the Navajo Aquifer. The Ann Aquifer is pristine potable drinking water. From 1968 to 2005, Peabody Coal Company used a mixture of half potable and aquifer water and half coal called slurry and transported the coal slurry through a 273 mile pipeline to Mojave Generating Station in Laughlin, Nevada. It is estimated that every year, for over a 40 year period, 1.3 billion gallons of water was used in the process. The Navajo Reservation lies between the Upper Colorado River Basin and the Lower Colorado River Basin, yet the 173,667 Navajo, resi Navajo residents who live on the reservation receive no drinking water from the Colorado River. With the help of the Central Arizona Project, pumps 500 billion gallons of Colorado River water a year and diverts the river's natural course 336 miles to the communities of Central and Southern Arizona. The CAP receives its energy from Navajo Generating Station, which is not owned by the Navajos, but rather six entities. The Bureau of Reclamation, who is a subsidiary of the Department of Interior, owns 24.5% of NGS. The Department of Interior is a trustee to all Indians in America. They have a trust responsibility, yet they allow our people to be poisoned. Navo Generating Station also releases toxic metals and acids into the air, including hydrochloric acid, mercury, lead, chromium, and nickel. Mercury is a neurotoxin that affects hundreds of thousands of newborn babies each year and can cause brain damage and harm memory, attention, language, and motor skills. Chromium and nickel are carcinogens. They can cause lung, bladder, kidney, and skin cancer. Navajo Generating Station receives its coal from Peabody Coal Company. 
due to all the water being sucked up from the end aquifer. We are running out of drinking water. The springs and wells that used to produce water within our Navajo and Hopi lands are becoming dry. We are running out of time, and the corporations, lawmakers, and senators know this, and yet continue to use this to their advantage. On behalf of Senator McCain and myself, I am pleased today to introduce the Navajo Hopi Little Colorado River Water Rights Settlement Act of 2012. This is Senate Bill 2109. It is propitious as the state of Arizona today celebrates its centennial, its 100th birthday, that we also have the opportunity to resolve significant water rights issues for the Navajo Nation, the Hopi Tribe, and water users throughout the Southwest. Importantly, this settlement would not only inure to the benefit of the Navajo Nation and Hopi Tribe, but it would also provide immeasurable benefits to non-Indian communities throughout Arizona, California, and Nevada. They don't know. They just don't have the answers. They don't, they're just going along with it. And it's disappointing to hear that even his aides saying, oh, it's going to be John Kyle's, it's a legend for him. It's going to be what he's going to be remembered for. I tried going to the Navajo Nation Council, then the delegate of Ganaru. Just a simple, I want to intern for you. It was difficult. You couldn't talk to him. You know, he brushed me off saying like, well, I don't take care of that. You go to another office. You know, not unhelpful. And it's sad coming to Washington, D.C talking to these high-profile people, senators and um, directors of programs, um, and they tell you, well, you need to talk to your tribal government. It's a government-to-government -government relation, and you need to speak to them. And where do you go from there when one government turns you away and tells you to speak to the other one? Well, the tribal government turns you away saying you don't know what you're talking about. You have no idea what we go through. And it makes me question, do they know what we go through as people? Do they understand that we have worries for the future? Uh, will we give up certain natural resources for a whole other population to exist? What about our existence? I'm not. 
put that on. No, I'm just going to leave right now. Navajo way of understanding our universe is uh, is not we didn't make those things those things were done by by something that is larger than us that we can't manipulate something that was put in place here here for us so if if we if we understand and appreciate the universe and the way things, the nature of things, we, we, we come to understand and respect uh, what, what it is that, that, that we need to preserve and protect and carry forward. Because without it, we're just going to be in, 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 in disharmony or disarray. So we need to really preserve what has been done in the past in order to be also in balance and, and, and with the nature in the future. So that needs to be understood both, both ways and respected in that same way. We just can't have one part of it. You have to have the whole unit in order to be in harmony in, in the future as well as it was in the past. Our reservation has grown 500%. Our growth was due in part by sustaining our natural way of life. As caretakers of the land, we were instructed by the Creator to live within the four sacred mountains and the water that surrounds us. Both the Kiva and the Hogan represents our place in the universe. As Navajo and Hopis, our religion is of nature, based on sacred springs and mountaintops. We are guided by natural laws, from birth to death. We are a part of the earth. It is said through the beauty of nature, we gain the beauty in our lives. In the future, you know, when I'm my father's age or when I'm my grandmother's age, you know, I'm not sure if there's going to be a generation that knows how to grow corn, knows how to herd sheep and use that knowledge. My culture is strong, and it has been strong, and it's still strong, but it's us, the generation, who are weak. Are we just going to give up and let our culture disappear, let it leave us and not stay connected with it? Or are we going to struggle and keep on the fight 
to hold it and hold it sacred. Because without us, you know, that culture is always going to be there, but we just won't remember it. What we share with other tribes is a sense of virtue, a heritage of belonging to the earth. We are only seeking acceptance within our cultures. We have hope in our hearts to continue our work for the duty of our earth. What we have done, what has happened to our land, is happening to our people, our future, and our youth. Disparity has left scars upon our lives. The pain that seeps into our spirit, we continue to struggle. We fight each and every day to preserve these memories as truths. Yet, we must remember the faces of the past are imprinted upon our soil, embedded upon the grains of sand we stand upon. Their survival lives within you. How can we change as people through what we see? What can we understand from the deaths of our loved ones? Should we acknowledge the worlds they have traveled through to teach us what we know now? Your connection to the earth and the stars above must be respected in order to define your existence. For in this land, our ancestors have given us tells our people's story. With every year of corn, and every song that is sung, every drink of water gives you the power to inherit their legacy.